<laughs> oh my gosh. Um, all right, let's unpack some more twins here after uh, another disappointing game last night. Although a, a, a furious rally for the twins for the second straight night, where they uh, they almost they almost pulled that one off late. What um, can we actually deck? Can we can we play one of these Rocco clips real quick again and react? I know we played one off the top of the scoop with Doogie, but. Uh, can we just hear from Rocco, sort of an, an exasperated Rocco, the Twins facing their longest losing streak of the season? Just hear from him again. Yeah, I think, um, you know, changing a team's mindset or general feel or energy, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but I but I do think that we just need to play baseball and not be, um, you know, worrying about the stresses of the fact that we haven't been playing well. I think that... Uh, you know, doing just allowing our guys to go out there and play naturally and go out there and do, you know, all the, the wonderful things that they can do out there, which we haven't seen for a little while. But, um, you know, freeing them up, I think, mentally is is one of the best things that we can do for them right now. It's my take. I want to throw this at you. All right. And this is coming from a guy. I am I am all about meditation. I am all about I'm all about sort of the all the, all of the things that Rocco tends to to preach about life, you know, just getting your rest and just being your best version of yourself. I'm all in on self-help Rocco here, okay? But when his response to a couple really tough losses, Byron Buxton going on the injured list for the first time, longest losing streak of the season. Twins are 9 games below 500 since May 24th. 20% chance to make the playoffs according to espn.com. When your response is basically, we just need to change the energy. His response is basically vibes, man. Vibes, man. We just got to change the got to change the vibes around here. Yep. How does that land with you? And how do you think it lands with the players in the clubhouse? Um, okay, so I think there's a ton to unpack here because what he did, first of all, to me is a last gasp move, which is He's not a, he's trying to act like this whole thing can be changed by vibes being changed, which I don't buy. But anyway, um, here's what I don't think he so this all gets back to the twins often doing things. They don't understand what they just did. OK, and what Rocco did last night opens up Pandora's box, because here's the thing I say if I'm a player, especially a veteran player, if I'm Sonny Gray, for instance, and I'm not saying that Sonny Gray is going to Cooperstown, but I am saying he's been a pretty efficient player. And, and you got him for a reason, and um, he's a guy who I think we could all consider to have been reliable, okay? If I'm Gray, I say, okay, dude, that's awesome. But really, this starts with you and Derek Falvey, not with us. And those vibes need to change coming from you. And, and when you say, you know what, cut it loose, don't give a bleep, Okay. That then, uh, that then extends and applies to your office. So that's not a clubhouse thing. That's not just a clubhouse thing. It certainly trickles into it. But here's what I say. If I'm Sonny Gray, I say, okay, dude, that's awesome. We are going to have fun. And you know how I have fun? By not being concerned, I might get pulled when I'm pitching well in the sixth because I am about to face the White Sox the third time through. I have fun by saying I might pitch a complete game. So... What I need you to do, what I need you to do is sit down, watch a ball game, and allow me to have fun. Now, if you're going to come out there, if you're going to, and I think I believe personally this comes from above Rocco, but for the sake of this conversation, it almost doesn't matter. If you are going to impose your 2 p.m. beliefs on me at 8.35 p.m., I'm going to be uptight. That's going to make me uptight. I'm expecting to get pulled. Um, and so what Rocco's done, and I hope he understands this, because if players are smart, they will take advantage now, is they will say, you have opened a door because fun is also you sitting down, watching baseball, being quiet sometimes, and not telling me I'm done because, again, I just cycled through the order for a second time. Does he understand what he said? That's my question. And I can tell you right now, the lack of common sense used by this club at times indicates to me he might not because he cannot continue to apply his beliefs to this team and then tell this team, lighten up, Francis. But what are you saying? Are you, 
what are you saying though? Are you saying that? Are you saying that Rocco Baldelli is the main reason why this team isn't playing at their peak capability, or what? Like, what is your? I know that you're saying, well, I mean, there's a hypocritical nature to this that if you really want me to play free spirited, then I don't want to have to look over my shoulder every time I get four and two thirds into a game, and I understand that. But correct, I guess. To what extent do you think it's Rocco himself holding this team back? I believe that it starts with a mentality that clearly, in my opinion, something's wrong here. Like, it doesn't take a genius to watch this team and say something's wrong. And, and injuries look, are part of it. And 100%. injuries are part of it. And your lineup's not that great. I I get that totally. But if you're talking about if you what, – what he's trying to say is, I think, all right, we're not that – like, we got a lot of guys out. And so we are going to take the guys that we, we have, and we're going to start being loose and having fun. That, though, allows you to play baseball. And let's be honest, whether you like analytics or not, th this team right now does not really play baseball. They operate in, in, a, in a cookie cutter recipe of how baseball should work in the minds of some. Um, I'll give you a case in point. The Cleveland Guardians are successful, in my opinion, because one, good young talent, that helps a ton. And yes, they've got some very smart people from, from all sides of baseball. But ultimately, Tito Francona knows what buttons to push, right? And I guarantee you, you're not coming down to Tito and saying, Tito, here is what you are doing. And if you don't, you're in, in trouble. So what I'm trying to say is, if you're going to cut this thing loose, and that's what he's talking about, having fun, cutting it loose, let's steal some bases, let's actually play some baseball, then you have to ease off the gas yourself to allow these athletes to enjoy themselves because I really do believe that there is an uptight nature going into games given they know exactly what the circumstances are going to be. And if I know I'm going to get removed from a game for no specific reason of things I've done wrong, as an employee, it makes me uptight. Well, I, I will, I will, I, even though I disagree with how often they do it, th there is a specific reason. It's the third time through the order. So, like, I think, I think it's but not I'm like, saying. But I'm saying that you know why you're being pulled from the game. It's because you're about to face a lineup the third time through the order. There's right, no amb I'm, ambiguity about why you're being pulled. From the game. But if I'm pitching well, do I? Is that the smart move? They're going to say yes, and I'm going to say I'm Sonny Gray. You got me for a reason. Yeah. I, I I am not saying everyone should it should apply, but I am saying they cookie they cookie cutter this thing down so narrowly now that they basically apply the same rules almost all the time to everybody. So one of the great examples of how, you know, like this, this, there's a couple points I want to touch on that you just brought up. Let's start with the fact that they don't actually play good baseball. And, and, and base running is a huge microcosm. Huge microcosm might be an oxymoron. But it is a microcosm of, of one of the things that ails this team. And you saw this actually in the last inning last night. You saw this happen with um, with with both Jake Cave and Nick Gordon. So you're trying to come back from like a four run deficit in the ninth inning, and I forget the exact specifics. At one point, uh, I think the first part of this was Jake Cave hit a one hopper kind of off the end of the bat. It looked like it was going to be a laser at Jose Altuve, but it turned out like it. It didn't get on Altuve as quickly as he thought, and he kind of, like, he backhanded it. He was kind of covering up, thinking, oh, my God, this is a laser, but it wasn't. He botches it. The The inning continues. And then, the, and was it Kepler? The next hitter comes up and hits a ball right at Jose Altuve again, a line yes. drive in the air this time. Yep. Your run on second base does not matter. Like it matters only in that you you need to just not create an out on the base pass because the runs that really matter are behind you on first base and at the plate. And Nick Gordon who's been largely a bad base runner, a bad route taker in the outfield. He's he's emerged a little bit with his bat this season. Um and that's been good to see. But his first instinct on a ball hit to the right side of the infield in the air is to is to speed off second base and try to get to third as fast as possible because he's thinking if that gets through I got to score right like that's mm -hmm. what he's thinking mm -hmm. if that ball hits the ground they're not throwing a third base in that situation he's going to throw to second base and try and turn two you know he's trying to try and turn a four six three so freezing on that play and I this is I'm you know 
as a guy who peaked in high school as a baseball player. I'm not trying to talk down to Major League Baseball players here, but, like, dude, your run doesn't matter. It's like baseball 101. Freeze on a line drive in that situation. And his immediate instinct was to not freeze, right? Well, that's kind of a systematic problem that we've seen with the Twins this year. And they are analytically the second-worst base running team in baseball. A couple minutes later, Jake Cave, who's on first base, or maybe this is before, sometime in the same inning, Jake Cave, your run also doesn't matter. The tying run, I think, is at the plate at this point. So your goal is to just not commit an out on the base paths. And he's taking these spastic, giant, secondary, and tertiary leads. Yes. Trying to get a big jump out, right? Just if there's a ball to the gap, I got to score. It's like, dude, if there's a ball to the gap, the run that matters is the run behind you. You're not, like, it doesn't matter. So just don't get picked off by the catcher. And he almost does. This happened two nights in a row, by the way. He almost got picked off uh, two nights ago. And so these are like these are super small things that stand out to me that are fundamental to the Twins' terrible base running this season, fundamental to the fact that they just don't play good baseball and do things that can win you games in the margins. Um, and so like let let's let's start there in terms of things that Rocco can impact, little things like that. Why are you not better at as a team? Why is Jake Cave allowed to take these giant secondary leads in situations where your run doesn't matter? That's a that's a that's a microcosm for something bigger. They do some you, really dumb things. Yes. Mm -hmm. You also bring up Terry Francona, so he is regarded, I think, in my lifetime as one of the five best managers. I mean, he was, mm -hmm. and it's it's hard to quantify the value of a baseball manager because you're not out there scheming like you are if you're an NFL coach. Um, you know, in the NBA, you can diagram inbounds plays and different things, right? But it's really about creating an environment on a day-to-day -day basis that can maximize the success of all of your players. That is what being a great manager is. If you can, year after year after year, and then some of it's like, do you have a better roster? Like, if you have a great roster and this guy over here doesn't, then obviously you're going to win more games. But I think where Terry Francona has been brilliant with the Red Sox for all those years and with Cleveland the last 10 years is he creates these environments where players are just emerging into the peak versions of themselves as baseball players. And that's why this Guardians team that was supposed to be rebuilding and tanking is 10 games over 500, just playing f everything that Rocco wanted the Twins to do, right? It's I wrote down all these little buzz phrases, the energy, uh, playing naturally, like the vibes. Francona creates that everywhere he goes. Right. I don't and know how he does it. I don't know what the secret sauce is, but Rocco isn't doing it with the Twins. The front office isn't doing it the last couple of years with the Twins. And that's the most important thing. So look at how Cleveland works and look at how the Twins work. And therein lies the difference. And therein, and therein lies the problem of with, with Falvey, what the Twins thought they were getting that they actually did not get. Frank Kona... While I while I think he's certainly adopted some new school ways, because I don't think he's a Mike Sosha stuck in the mud, you know, get get all Not get all. these reams of paper out of here. Dude, he worked for <laughs> Theo Epstein. Yes, exactly. That's all but, you need to know. But the fact is he also has a human feel. He has a touch for as you said, getting the most from players. But where Cleveland succeeds, where Falvey is failing miserably, is this too. Look at the influx, and it feels like it's constant. And I don't don't know if that's true or not, but the influx of young pitching that that team constantly gets. And I'm not talking one guy. I'm talking multiple guys. They trade away guys. They make good trades. They bring in guys. They draft well. Um, my perception, and this is reckless speculation, but my perception is Derek Falvey, it feels like, has his handprints all over the day-to-day -day management attempts of games themselves. I don't need him to do that. Hire a manager you trust. And if you don't trust Baldelli, then he shouldn't be your guy. But where Falvey is failing is how much young talent, how much influx of talent is he consistently bringing in across the board, especially pitching? And I think when you look at Dylan Bundy, when you look at the comings and goings of Smeltzer, when you look at, you know, a uh, 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 Jay Happ and, and Rich Hill, and I can go through the entire list. The answer is not nearly e enough. I need him to stop trying to help set the lineup, help set the pitch count. If your manager can't do that, find one that can. 
I need you to get out on the road or however you do it with film. I don't really care, but I need you to find pitching and I need you to develop it. And I don't need you in the manager's office every single day. It's fine. Look, they, they should talk. I'm not saying that they shouldn't. That would be a mistake. But I think when you look at what Cleveland does successfully and what the Twins don't and what the Twins thought that they were getting in Falvey, and if the Twins cared enough to really find out where this is going wrong, you would find it is the fact that Cleveland has a system that works. And I don't think right now, it's, I think it's fair to say this, the Twins system is malfunctioning. Yes. And I don't think the Twins system, the last two years in particular, has lended itself to maximizing the the the, the peak version of players. That's like a great it, point. like there's been a there's you know a rise has peaked here in 2022 and there's and, and I'm not saying that nobody peaks cuz that would be unrealistic too. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason and I and I keep going back to Sano and Kepler. Well, but injuries. Okay, well is that really the only reason why Miguel Sano has not emerged into what he should have been in his prime? Is it just injuries? Is there something more? Why, why are some of these key cornerstone players, these young pitchers, why are they not emerging into their 90th percentile as players? What is it? I don't know, but I know that it's not happening. And it, ha- and it clearly happens all the time. I mean, Cleveland, I feel like Cleveland's tried to rebuild four times in the last 10 years. <laughs> their, their pitching's too And they good. can't. They can't rebuild because they're awesome every step of the organization, <laughs> which is part of the reason why the Twins hired Derek Falvey six years ago. Oh, let's just go pluck the third guy from that organization and get their right. secret sauce. Um, and they tapped into something for a couple years because the Twins were a 100-win team not that long ago. But something, I guess my final point on this, and we can get to old tweets exposed or whatever, but something feels off about this organization beyond injuries. Like there's, I, I don't think injuries are just an explanation for, cause you could say, I mean, come on, what are you supposed to do? Buxton, Kirilov, Larnick, you know, Mally, who they traded for paddock, who they traded for. I mean, right. those are preventable, but uh, what are you supposed to do? We got all these injuries. I don't know. It's, it's, it's bad luck, and I think there's a certain chunk that's bad luck. I don't know if it's 20% or 75%, yep. but I am curious about the other chunk of it that is, that is more ambiguous and harder to quantify. It's behind the curtain. Yep. There's something systematic about it. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but something just feels a little off about this organization the last couple of years. Here's what I also don't like, um, and I think good franchises – don't do this nearly as much as it feels like the Twins do, do now. And it's something that usually has to play itself out. So, so, like, the thing about this is the first year or two of an, a new staff, like, you can be like, oh, they're doing a good job or a terrible job, but that that doesn't necessarily define them completely because you do have to get five, six years in, right? There is a stubbornness about how the front office operates that I absolutely abhor. Case in point. Pagan. The fact that they stuck and stick with him, to me, is unfathomable. I don't know why they're doing it other than they made the trade and damn it, it's going to work. Um, You know, when you move on from Duffy, which I'm fine with, I appreciate that, but Pagan, but you're like, but we're keeping him because he's got, and then you force Rocco to be like, oh, you should, his stuff, I mean, yeah, you you guys don't, you don't know how great he is. No, he's been an unmitigated disaster, okay? And the Rodgers thing, too, the apologists who are like, well, Rodgers has been terrible for two months, so that trade's a wash. It's not a wash. Rodgers was a commodity that you had to trade, you made a trade, you picked up a guy who was hurt and you knew it, and now this guy is failing, and... If you had kept Rodgers, you could have, because if you recall, he got off to a great start with the Padres. You could have traded him at that point and maximized it. The other thing is, and this is a direct comparison to Cleveland, and again, it's a stubbornness, and fans here buy into it, and it drives me absolutely bleeping crazy. The The Guardians had their own Miguel Sano. His name was Fran Mill Reyes, who they got in a trade with the Padres. It's the same player. Big bopper. Uh, guy, tremendous power. It's going to be great. Do you know what he was? He turned into a strikeout machine. Do you know what Cleveland did about a month and a half back or so? They said, this ain't working. I think they DFA'd him. He's with the Cubs now, which is fine. The Cubs stink. But the point is, 
you know, for all that we've talked about, and, and I know he's hurt now, but when you, but I'm talking about a pattern of stubbornness. And, and there were a lot of very smart people who do talk shows who said a while back, you know what, Miguel Sano, you should probably move on. And the twins are like, oh, no, oh, no, we can't do that. We're not going to do that. Fran Mill Reyes is the same exact player. And look at what the Guardians did. They said, screw it. You know what? Didn't work. The twins are like, oh, no, we're going we're gonna to milk this thing out. This, it, it's, I know that's one thing, but it's a pattern of things which is a stubbornness of we're going to make this work. No, you're not. You're not going to game a system that can't consistently be gamed. That's what drives me nuts. Mm. Oh, that felt good. It drives you crazy. That was therapeutic as hell right there. Man, that was the best 20 minutes of my COVID-laden week so far. Right there. (laughs) Oh, just cutting that vein open. No, don't don't talk about cutting. Don't don't talk about cutting. (laughs) My midsection hurts. Don't talk about that. God. Um, well, I, Judd's been, Judd's been cutting some weight over the past year. Uh, yes, not yes. anything to do with uh, no, his zero. appendectomy. Zero. But uh, about a year ago, he embarked on a weight loss journey that landed him 40 pounds lighter. Uh, that's, exactly, that's exactly right. And, and that, of course, is thanks to my friends who I've been talking about for months now because it's been so successful. Livia Weight Control Centers. Yes, I said centers. It's not a diet place. It is a place where you drop the weight, and then guess what? Here's the best part. You keep the weight off. I dropped 40 pounds. Best part, it's staying off. Dawn joined me because she said, you're losing all that weight. I want to, too. Down 16 pounds in progress. But you know what? It feels great, and I w- want you to join us now. It's teamwork. It's fantastic. The anniversary sale, you can join the program, 50% off. That's right, 50% off. 855-GO-L-I-V-E-A-LIVIA.COM. L-I-V-E-A dot com for the new you, and I will guarantee you, you'll be very happy. Also, hey guys, listen, okay, so ED doesn't have to be a big secret or a big thing to be ashamed of. In fact, you can get a handle on it through Valley Park Medical Clinic, which is dedicated to providing breakthrough ED remedies to men in the greater Minneapolis area. Valley Park's approach is medical. It is surgery-free, drug-free, and non-invasive. And they'll work with you in a discreet manner to make you feel right at home so you can ask any question in a professional and confidential environment. ValleyParkMedicalClinic.com. ValleyParkMedicalClinic.com. All right. Now that we got that out of our system, unless, Dex, unless you want to add anything to that. Yeah, he's the season ticket holder. Uh, uh, no, I, I'm, and I'm discontinuing those for now. Um, and also, it, it's not even the fact that they've fallen out of contention and they probably could miss the playoffs here, and it's just not a really likable group. Uh, just finances and 20 games. Like, I thought 20 games would be the perfect amount. It ends up being a lot, like, especially like when you're trying to like plan out things. And like, there's been yeah. games I've pushed, and you know, and it stinks too because the central is so bad. And obviously, you, you get. The Royals, Tigers, Cleveland, Chicago. Like, I don't want to go to those games. I will say, looking at the schedule in 2023, which, by the way, putting 16 GD home <laughs> games in April That's makes good. me infuriated as it is. But there, there are, like, other encouraging games. Like, in the month of May, they have the Cubs. They have Toronto. Toronto's always a fun team to see. Um, they have, like, cool teams coming. But I think 20 games, it becomes a little bit much. It's not in the fact of the finances. It's just the time commitment. And who knows where I'm going to be living, like, this time next year. Like, it, the, my whole point of being in the North Loop oh, wow. was... Let's yeah, I've, I've your dog. It's Vinny. It's not necessarily all Vinny, but it's it's yeah. It's both <laughs> my. It's a lot it's of Vinny. Let's be honest. I, I mean, I I move for it's, Stella. I'm not it's, criticizing. It's, it's I will both say the we, people. We have uh we have some feedback Friday comments coming in about the the Vinny about apartment the situation we can get, get into, into tomorrow. tomorrow. Yes, I'm actually like it's one of the top five most said I've, I've ever been to talk about anything on Score North. You're still mad. Is yeah, I'm very mad. Let's save it for tomorrow. Yeah, save it for tomorrow. Oh, I'm not going to bring it up. Talk about it. I'm very excited to bring it up. All right, uh, let's do some old tweets exposed, though. All right, so here we, go. we old talked tweets about uh, we discussed Max Kepler being a bust. So I decided to do a little comb of uh, Max Kepler takes and tweets from us. Here was uh, Phil Mackey. I think this was May of 2021, uh, and he was talking about how, hey, you know, in 2006, Justin Morneau got unlocked. Well, where is that? For June, Kep- June 6th, or whatever it was, and became the American League MVP because it was in there. It's in there for Kepler. I don't think he's as well-rounded of a hitter as Justin Morneau was because Morneau could go opposite field. Morneau was just a great hitter. I mean, Morneau won a batting title in Colorado later in his career, right? 
But is there is what's the come to Jesus moment with Kepler, with Polanco, with Sano? Has there been one, and they just haven't responded to it? And who gets like, it these from dudes them? have shown like they are the they have shown that they can perform at an MVP level in the past. All right, wow, that is that. That's yeah. not an old tweet exposed. That is clairvoyancy yeah. right there. Yeah, that's good. Right. Did you are, did you find something incriminating in there, or uh, were you just highlighting how a hundred percent spot on I was about Kiss Max up. Kepler having suck up potential to be? What I was saying there is there's kind of a fork in the road. It's like, dude, you can either perform like this the rest of your career, or you can, you know, re- regress the way that he has the last three years. Has, I guess he has the gone road. the. Justin Morneau went one way at that fork, and Max Kepler kind of has gone the other way. Uh, okay. Good thing he's a good corner outfield defender. Otherwise, he would be that unplayable helps. completely. But He's a defensive replacement late in games is what he's become. Well, but oh. he's a, he is a really good defensive right, outfielder. Yeah, he's good so guy. I think I would have less of a problem with him in general if, well, I mean, his career has been a disappointment. But I need my corner guys to hit. But if they if they had more offense in and around that lineup, you'd be able to live with like oh, I guess this isn't the version of Kepler we thought we were going to get four years ago. But like he still brings some value as a yeah, you know as a guy who's going to hit 15 home runs and play some corner outfield defense. But it's more glaring that there's all these other holes in the lineup, and you expected him eight years ago, three years ago to be something more than he is with the bat. Oh, but here we are. He's 29 years old. Kind of is what he is. All right, Judd Zolgad. Not a whole Kepler take, but a Twins outfield take. You know, if Jake Cave can hit like this and play like a decent center fielder, it's a big for the Twins to be able to return Kepler to right field on occasion. Thad Levine talked on Score North about the wear and tear on Kepler, and this comes down yes. to playing in center so much. If Jake Cave can hit a little bit, you never know. September 3rd, oh, 2019. Yeah. I, uh. I remember that one, and, and that is because I was never a fan of the fact that when Buxton was hurt then, which of course was was um, frequent. That Kepler was the primary guy to move to center, which I absolutely couldn't stand because he is really good on right, and he was okay, I thought, in center. But yeah, uh, the Jake Cave take is way off base. Jake he could, Cave. Jake Cave is Jake. Yeah, Jake Cave found a perfect place. I mean, he was at home in St. Paul. Since you tweeted that, I just looked this up on Fangraphs. So C- Cave actually had a pretty decent first season with the Twins in 2018, or he, like his his bat yeah. was yep. respectable, and he was just a really good backup outfielder in 2018. And uh, and then 2019, the wheels came off a little bit, but actually his offense wasn't bad in 2019. The last three years since you tweeted that, he has been worth, according to Fangraphs, minus point one wins above replacement, meaning he is. He, Take a replacement below, level, replacement like level. AAA caliber outfielder. He has been below that level the last three years. Yes. So yeah, if Kepler were good. if Kepler were were uh, was, was still productive, I I would now replace Cave's name in that tweet with Celestino. Yeah. Yeah. I just so, don't, didn't want Kepler playing center field. Didn't like. Okay. It. Not super incriminating because you were just kind of floating a hypothetical there. You know, not too bad. This, also oh, during this, this looks like it could be bad. July 21st, 2019. Uh, here comes Kepler, and honestly, I wouldn't want anyone else up for the Twins right now. I was very much buying high on the Max Kepler stock should have been. in 2019. But at that point, why not? You were right. I'm going to look this up here. I mean, Nelson right, Cruz so. is probably the more, you know, maybe the guy I wanted up in 2019. No, Kepler was, was one of their hot. best players, man. And he's probably he was good. red he hot. He's good. I, but... My Jake Cave one's pretty bad. Like I, I will fall on on the sort of saying that Jake Cave could play, dude. So Max, so you tweeted this on what July twenty four? What time? Five seventeen uh, p.m. Five, seven, must have been a weird time for a game. Was that a okay. weekend? So maybe? they were playing. He had a big game that day, so they were playing oh. Oakland Cleveland? at home. Okay. Let me see okay. what time this game started here. It was uh, an afternoon game, and uh, Max Kepler. I think he hit a granny in this game. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, he not... hit. A, he did hit. Uh, he hit a three-run jack in the second inning in this game. So you tweeted this late in the game, a win against Oakland. So he was already having a big game, big season, and then uh, they walked off in the bottom of the ninth. Did he walk off? I got to. I got to find this now. 
Okay, so bottom of the ninth. Look at this. This is very Roycey like of you. This is all bottom of the ninth. I gotta, I gotta find this thing on my phony. Off Liam Hendricks, a single to left field, a yeah. walk off to score. Ira Adrianza. I feel like Dex was validated here big time because I agree with that. Max had a walk off. I think my on one's the, sometimes I think mine is the worst because yeah, I said I J Cave. Sometimes it's old tweets exposed, and sometimes it's it's bringing takes back into the light that uh, that also still worked out. Yeah, that's fair. To prove but we were right. But your tweet is what's so disappointing about now. Yes. Like that guy was. We thought this guy's damn good, and and he was for the season. Okay, yeah. I have a. I have sort of a, I don't know, a psychological question for you guys here on the Twins. Yep. Do you do you ever feel like you're made to feel guilty by large chunks of fans and even like the Twins themselves for how frustrated you get with the Twins? Feel like sometimes, sometimes I sit here and think, man, my level of angst with this team is 10 out of 10. Yeah. And I and I almost feel like I'm an outcast because of it. Because like, well, you know, what did you really expect? Well, yeah. I expect more than zero wins in eighteen yeah. playoff games over a two decade period. I guess like, su sue me. <laughs> I think it's more of you feel guilty. Um, in my case, I just feel guilty for the people around me because because as I've expressed, I'm just an, I'm a, I'm a horrible person when when the Twins are losing big moments in in key games and stuff. So I, I more feel. Guilty for the people around me. During the playoffs in 2019, I removed myself. I turned off my cell phone for eight innings because I just wanted to experience this game without being controlled from Twitter, controlled by my emotions. I just wanted to be glued into the TV. I feel more guilty about that, uh, but it is it is frustrating, right? Because I we want to see the team be extremely successful, and you grow up as a kid wanting to see the team actually do it, and it's been almost 20 years and they still haven't even won a playoff game with 18 tries. If they didn't make the playoffs for 20 years, I think it's kind of honestly a different conversation. But they, they've made the playoffs Damn. plenty, and they have blown every chance in the 18 tries they've been there. I feel like there's a weird... The, the Twins are weird. There is a weird like defense shield around them um, from both internally from them and people close to them where where there's the old well yeah but but i mean but you don't know this or you don't know that i mean um it's a and what's really weird about the twins is and i don't think the vikings are like this it's all or nothing for instance joe mauer sucks he's awful he's the worst like okay let's look at him look you know yes the the end's disappointing but this guy was a hall of fame catcher there's no question about that um, but those people are like, he sucks. Or it's just because the poll ads are cheap or this team would win. Okay, that's not all true. So I so so let's talk about that. But then there's this weird outer thing around the twins, a shell, right? That that makes you you feel like you're wrong for questioning things. Um, it's a very strange existence, and I don't necessarily get it. Yeah. And and outside of a guy like Roycey. I don't necessarily think that they are covered, especially uh, with with the curiosity of what's wrong here. And what's really weird is this. And this has struck me as being, this year particularly, the weirdest thing. So it's no surprise. Bally's has pom-poms out. Like, we've known that. that. That's no surprise. But the radio guys are the most often critical. Yeah, apparently has Atterbury was uh, torched him. It's right. last night. And Provis and Provis literally gets mad. But but yeah. but he does it, but he's not defending them. He's mad because he wants to watch a good product. And I guess my question is this where's more of that? That's what yeah. I want. I remember so, yes, one, it's weird. I remember one time, uh and this happens with like all different teams and different sports, you know, the organization would prefer that they don't get criticized, right? That's as an organization, sure. you would love if you could just like screw up and make bad decisions and never be called on it and never be held accountable by media or fans or anything. But I remember one time in particular, because I covered the Twins beat, my career has come full circle. I now have people on Twitter telling me to stick to football when I tweet about the Twins. I saw that. That was ten awesome. Year, ten years ago, it was stick to baseball because I was my, – my background in media is largely baseball uh, up until the last, I don't know, eight or ten years. And so when I covered the Twins beat as a writer for a few years, uh, there were some trips where, like, our company, there was a couple years where I would go on a bunch of road trips. There was one in particular where I, w I wasn't on the road, but I was still, like, writing off games and 
providing commentary and then doing you know radio show and stuff. But um, they were playing Tampa, and I don't remember all the specifics, but it was like a two to one game, late, close, you know, and. I had called, I had criticized Ron Gardenhire for sending Drew Butera to the plate or something in a situation <laughs> where, where, uh, I wish I had this in front of me because I, like I, I had logically kind of like spelled out what should have happened. Sure. They had, they had like Jason Kubel and Jim Tomey available as pinch hitters. And yet in a one run game in the eighth of the ninth, they ran out Drew Butera. I was like, why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. And so. And Denard Spam was on deck. I think there was a runner on second base. So first base was open, if I remember right. And I said, it makes no sense. Why would you not run one of these thumpers up over the worst position player hitter in the entire league? And, uh, and I wrote about it, the, ta- the tactical mistake. And this is why, you know, this is why you lose games. You may, if you miss the playoffs by a game or whatever, like th- this is the type of decision that can lose you a playoff game or seating or whatever. And I, I got a call from someone in the organization the next day, very disappointed. Like, hey, Gardy thought you were one of his guys. Oh, God. Oh, I hate <laughs> that. And by the way, I love Gardy to yeah. this day. Gardy and I had a couple dust-ups. I don't know if he loves me. I respect the hell out of that guy. I, I loved working alongside him, so to speak, in my job and his job for years. Yep. But I got a phone call from someone in the organization saying, hey, Gardy thought you were one of his guys, just really disappointed that you wrote that article, especially since you're not here, you know, to to at least like get the, it was the pandemic the before the pandemic. Yeah, And I said, well, first of all, like it's not I, I, I can't I can't defend the fact that I'm not there. My company just like doesn't send me to all the road trips. I don't know what you to say. But we got into this back sort of back and forth. And ultimately, I think, you know, Gar- Gardy was trying to like send a message through the team to me saying, well, just so you know, if you pinch hit Tommy in that situation, they're going to walk him anyways and take the bat out of his hand, and now you're out your your defensive catcher. And I said, yeah, but now you've now you've leapfrogged over Drew Butera, however you did it, to get to Denard Span, who's a 300 hitter with a runner on second base. Wouldn't you rather have Span swinging away, even if you have to leverage one of your pawns off the bench to get there, than Drew Butera? Okay, that's a fair point. But, I don't, but I'll never forget the sort of like the disappointment from the organization and like, well, how could you criticize this, right? Um, and so yep. I, I think there's always, I guess, to sum up this grand point that we're maybe having a, a hard time explaining, it always feels like, oh, how could you criticize? We're the little engine that could. Like, how could you criticize us, little old us? We're not the Yankees. Right. And I say in a vacuum in any given year or any given matchup against the Yankees, yes, you are the little engine that could, and that's fine. But you are not as much the little engine that could now that you've been at target field for 12, 13 seasons. Right. And after two decades of not winning a playoff game and then potentially missing the playoffs two years in a row here, like, I'm sorry, but my frustration on behalf of fans is boiling over again, and that's well, sort of how I feel. And it, first of all, it's your job to analyze and critique what you saw so it's not your job to be ron ron's guy the other thing that i've always said is this because this is the this shuts them up automatically okay if i'm his guy let's meet and let him tell me everything because if i'm his guy i'm his guy yeah and by the way like all all of those things kind of came about like we had i think it it even improved our relationship sure our working relationship Right, but, but said, I'm just saying like, I'm going to criticize you sometimes, so don't be shocked by it. No. But if we're guys, <laughs> I, I need the scoops. I need the scoops. It's my my favorite my favorite football thing was always pro football focus. You guys rely on that. You don't know what the blocking assignments were. You don't know if we were, you know, if 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 the guard was supposed to have have the, the guy that you thought the tackle was. And I say, okay, let's go watch it. Show me. Show me it all. Show me everything. Show me the game plan. Well, we can't, well, we do, can't do that. Yeah. Okay, then I'm but not the, your guy. The, the, then PFF is the closest you know, thing that's going to get you there. Yeah, or an sure. a, or or the other thing, Phil, and I, I bet you, you ran into this as well. Agents, right? Here's what you got to write. You got to write that this guy's screwing this guy. And I, I'd be like, that is awesome stuff. Go on the record. Oh, I can't go on the record. Well, then I can't write it. 
Yeah, I can't. It can't be my Like, there voice is the says, easiest yeah. thing is to turn the tables. Because I'm going to tell you right now, Rocco Baldelli ain't your friend. Rocco Baldelli might be an acquaintance at very best. But I guarantee you, if Rocco Baldelli, the second he, he leaves, you will never talk again. So, like, like, this whole thing about we're very disappointed is like, okay, first of all, I'm not a kid. Second of all, that's a bunch of crap. Yeah, and but again, I think that it's they've they've been the little engine that could since the two thousand since the contraction stuff in the late nineties, early two thousands, sure, and the Metrodome and the lack of revenue and all that stuff. But they, I don't view them as the little engine that could no. in the last thirteen years. They went Agreed. to a revenue changing ballpark that doesn't put them on the Yankees or the Red Sox level, but it puts them on a different level than they were twenty years ago, and that's the prism through which they should be judged. And they are not mm-hmm. living up to it since they got to target field and all of that is sort of loaded into my own personal critiques of this team in 2022 anyhow that's a wrap on Mackie and judd today great this therapy good. session here it's felt great real therapy. good some uh some vikings news we'll get to on purple daily today uh on a couple different fronts and uh tomorrow declan gets to rant about neighbors on feedback friday it'll be great